Good morning and happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Man, it's good to see everybody. You'll excuse me if I pretend like you're not there. You see, human nature uh, fears. But the Bible says, in principle, that where man's ability is recognized to be weakness, God's strength takes over and perfects it. Amen. And so I'm happy to be here with you this morning. Uh, our message this morning is going to be in regard to a specific topic that the Lord has impressed upon my heart recently. Um, it's not a topic that I've spoken of on before, but so, I, so I'm praying that you bear with me. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned, and so I'm going to invite you to reverently kneel with me as this weak vessel asks for help from my mighty Father. Amen? Amen. My Father, what a joy it is to call you my Father and my God. Lord, I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here with your people, my family, the apple of your eye. Lord, as I'm here, I kneel before you recognizing that I am insufficient for this task. But Lord, look not upon me. Look to the all-sufficiency of my Savior, I pray. Father, take this dust and do what you do best with dust. Create in me a clean heart. Renew in me a right spirit. I pray that you be with every mind in this room, every family represented, and those who could not be here. I pray, Father, that your word will go forth and do what it does best. In Jesus' name, amen. If you guys wouldn't mind singing the last stanza of that song you just sang to encourage me in the midst of this. There we go. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, to be. Goodness, like a fetter, draw me closer still to thee. Father, again, I ask for your assistance, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Malachi, chapter 4, beginning at verse 5 and 6, and say amen when you're with me. You see, the Old Testament ends with a very significant promise and prophecy uh, prior to the coming of Jesus Christ. It says, Behold, I will send you who? Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now pause there for a moment. For those of us who have studied this, we know that scripture prophetically refers to not one, not two, but how many Elijahs? Three, three Elijahs. The first Elijah, which we know was translated to heaven by the flaming chariot, by the, in the front of the very view of Elisha the prophet. The second Elijah, according to Matthew chapter 17, John the Baptist. Amen. There's a third Elijah. And the third Elijah refers to God's people, his last day church. And our job is actually outlined right here in verse 6. It says that we are to do what? And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. The mission of God's people in these last days is a mission of reconciliation within the home. Not only the heavenly home, the earthly home, united with the heavenly home. The principles that govern the heavenly home are to be seen perfectly in the homes of God's people on earth. In Joel chapter 2, verse 16, you don't have to turn there. I'll turn there and I'll read it. But for those of you who would like to, you can join me in Joel chapter 2, verse 16. The Bible says, gather the people Sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breasts. We're living in an anti-typical day of atonement, and God is not concerned with simply saving mothers and fathers. He wants to save the children as well. It's a family matter. No pun intended. It is a family matter that we are dealing with here. It says, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Now, in the context of this text, we know that the bridegroom is none other than who? Jesus. 
Jesus Christ. The bride is the church. The reason why the bride remains in the closet when a wedding is going on is only one reason. She's not dressed. She's not ready. The church has failed to put on the robe of Christ's righteousness for over 171 years, speaking directly to the remnant. Because then the rest of the world, it's over 2,000 years, I believe. Mm -hmm. 2,000 years. How long does it take a bride to get dressed? No pun intended. Again, the Bible says, let the bridegroom go forth. That means that there must be something that is hindering his going forth. Many people ask the question, why is Jesus not returned? Seventh-day Adventists in particular, as of October 22nd, 1844, have the belief that Christ moved from the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary into the most holy, most holy place. And what has he been doing since then for 171 years? Interceding. Interceding. Yes. In principle, the Bible shows us that it is a cleansing work. It is the work of creating in us a clean heart and renewing in us a right spirit. In the beginning... God created this entire world in the span of six days and then blessed a seventh day on the seventh day, hallowing it and creating the Sabbath. Seventh-day Adventists, recognizing the principle of creation that has the power to do in such a short amount of time, have taken 171 years to do what should be relatively simple. The gospel is a wonderful simplifier of life's problems. The issues that we're dealing with are not overburdening for God but they're overburdening for you, for me. And we need to learn to give the issue to God, beginning with the home. I want to start off by taking a look at the United States Constitution, just the preamble. Because in light of uh, recent events, I heard you guys speaking about it a little bit earlier, you know what's about to happen. I don't need to say it, but I will say it. There is a national Sunday law getting ready to pass in these United States of America. Not because Pope Francis is going to pass it, if you understand how the government of the United States works, you know that it is by the consent of the governed. governed. The power is with the people, not with the government. But what we're going to see as we study is that Satan has a plan to change the heart of the home from lamb to dragon, thus changing the nature of the, of the uh, Congress. It doesn't start with Congress, beloved. It starts in the home. The United States uh, Constitution, the preamble reads, we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, pay attention to this one, ensure domestic tranquility. What is, in, what is domestic tranquility? When you're dealing with domestics, you're dealing with the home. Family. We're family, amen? We're dealing with the home. Tranquility means peace. The Constitution was given to us in order to ensure domestic tranquility. The reason why I bring this up is because has a national Sunday law passed yet? No. Have your religious rights been revoked yet? Do, do you still have that? You still have that. So long as the Constitution is in place, the conditions, beloved, are perfect to get your homes in order. Those who wait for the passing of a national Sunday law or wait till after will find it Extremely difficult, even impossible to do what in a time of peace we were ordered to do. And so our subject for tonight is the Adventist home, or well, this morning, the Adventist home. Heaven's ordained method of explanation. I want to begin off with an opening thought. The great controversy between Christ and Satan, from its inception all the way to its final conclusion, serves as an open book question and answer session between a loving creator and his inquisitive creation. Now, for those of you who have taken an open book test before, you know that there are two things true about an open book test. The first, since the book is open, it should, I said should, not that it is, it should be relatively easy. Amen? But the second thing that's true about an open book test is the fact that the only way the test is easy is if you know where in the book to look in the first place. You can stand there, am I right? You can stand there with the book open all you want for an hour and time just goes by. You're looking through chapter three and the answers are in chapter six. You're looking through chapter four. You need to know where to look. Praise God, we know to look at Calvary, amen? Amen. amen. So our planet is the lesson book. 
The intergalactic intelligences are the students and the very life of Jesus Christ reproduced in the human family is the main curriculum. Now, what is the main question in this open book uh, question and answer session? The question is, is God as Satan accuses him to be or as Christ the Son demonstrates him to be? Who is this God that we serve? Who is this God that calls light out of nothingness? What I want to understand today is what has a more powerful influence on the mind, an accusation or a demonstration? Do the people of God know the difference? Because you see, for 171 years now, my family, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, have been saying that we are the people of God. But the Bible said that when this gospel is preached as a witness, then the end would come. We, it's still going on. So that means that something is going wrong. With, we are either saying something that isn't true or we are not living according to the principle. What is more powerful, an accusation or demonstration? The world, if you ask the world, the world will tell you, well, actions speak louder than words. That's the reason why actions can become a loud cry. You see, this is the issue to be addressed. The divine human family in Christ, we're going to see, is heaven's final answer to every question that Lucifer has brought up in his accusations. Every single question. I want to begin by taking a look at some significant statements made by uh, Ellen G. White, the prophet, so that we can see that our, amen, she is a prophet, so that we can see that the opening statement is indeed supported by the spirit of prophecy and so that we can understand the founding principles of where we're actually going in this study. The first of which is found in Desire of Ages. Don't worry, we won't read it all. Don't be scared. It says, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. From the days of eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ was one with the Father. He was the image of God, the image of his greatness and majesty, the outshining of his glory. Pay attention to this. It was to manifest this glory that he came to our world. Why did Christ come to this world? Manifest the glory of God. To manifest the glory of God. Somebody else says, well, Christ came to this world to destroy the works of Satan. We're going to see that they're both one and the same work. Because Satan's work was to misrepresent the character of God. And thus, in order to destroy the work of Satan, Christ had to demonstrate what God really looked like. Can't trust somebody you don't know. But Christ is the full revelation. It says, but not alone for his earthborn children was this revelation given. Our little world, insignificant as we may seem, is the lesson book of the entire universe. God's wonderful promise of grace, the mystery of redeeming love, is the theme into which angels desire to look. When I read that, I wondered to myself why it took me so long to desire to look into my own salvation. Why it took me so long to, to actually want to study the word of God. Angels are in heaven desiring to look at dust in Christ manifesting the glory of God. And we the dust who have the privilege of revealing the character of God Amen. share no interest. We share absolutely no interest. Don't tell me we share interest. Don't tell me we share interest because the message that came in 1888 according to the prophet should have and was potent enough to wrap up the work in two years. Do you know what that means? Well, I, I don't know the, the ages, but I know I wouldn't be born. In order for us to do the work that God has called us to do, we have to be comfortable with the fact that, Lord, listen, even if I wasn't born, let me be hidden, reveal Christ. It's not about me being born. I don't need to be here, but you must be revealed. The problem with the church, the problem with the home, the reason why we have so much tension is selfishness. We're selfish. For 171 years, Christ has been trying to hide self in him so that we can glorify the Father. And we've been taking a 171 years old selfie. That's what we've been doing. Wow, 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 wow. We think we're something to look at. <laughs> it will be seen that the glory which Christ came to reveal, shining in the face of Jesus, is the glory of self sacrificing love. So Christ came into this world to show us that God is self-sacrificing love. Nothing about God is self. In fact, when you study God's character, you see that everything he does is for you. Christ lives his life, the Father lives his life, as though they didn't exist. 
all they can see is creation. And creation in turn lives their life as though there is no creation. All they can see is the creator. Do you see how it balances out? Mm -hmm. Selfless love reciprocated by selfless love is the beloved circuit of beneficence. You can read about it in Desire of Ages chapter 1. Let's move forward. In heaven itself, this law was broken. What law? I didn't even touch that point. It says that the law of self-renouncing love is the law of life, the law of life for heaven and for earth. So self-renouncing law, re renouncing love is the law of God. And then it says in heaven itself, this law was broken because sin originated in self-seeking. Self Do you ever wonder to yourself, the Ten Commandments are written on two tablets. A man asked Jesus, what is the greatest out of all those commandments? Jesus responded, love your God. Love your fellow man. Jesus didn't say anything about you. He didn't say anything about self. There's a reason for that. On one side of the law, we are told what love for God looks like. On the other side of the law, we are told what love for one another looks like. The reason why self is nowhere in the law is because if everything I do is for you, my brother, and everything you do is for me, then what, what worry do I have to take of myself? God has covered it all. His government is perfect. There's, there's nothing to worry about. Lucifer, the covering cherub, desired to be what? Yes. He wanted to be alpha male, but he was dealing with the alpha and omega. He sought to gain control over heavenly beings and draw them away from their creator and win their homage to himself. Therefore, he misrepresented God, attributing to him the desire for self-exaltation. With his own evil characteristics, he sought to invest the loving creator. Thus, he deceived angels. Thus, he deceived men. He led them to doubt the word of God and to, trust, and to distrust his goodness. Satan realizes that, listen, if it works with angels, it's going to work with man. You don't change something that works. You don't. If it works, continue to work with it. Continue to work with it. The earth was dark through misapprehension of God. To know God is to love him. His characteristics must be manifested in contrast to the character of Satan. You know this sentence right here? The earth was dark through the misapprehension of God. Just looking into the physical. If this room is covered in darkness, and darkness is a problem for us, right? If it's dark and we can't see, what is the solution? Turn on the light. You're not going to grope around and look for a fork. A fork is not the solution to the darkness. You're going to turn on the light. We read that the light of the knowledge of the character of God is seen in the face of Jesus. That means that the solution, the remedy, the balm for the sickness that is darkness through the misapprehension of God is, is taken care of by Christ revealing the Father completely. Oh, gosh. Praise the Lord. To live for self is to perish. How many of us are dying in here today? To live for self is not to wait for perishing. It is the reality of the, it is the thing. To live for self is to perish. Covetousness, the desire of benefit for self's sake, cuts the soul off from life. Another physical example. Everything that man does for himself destroys not only the man, but everything that he's associated with. Wow. The family is destroyed. The peace and tranquility of the home. The Constitution won't matter if self is in the home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a man sees a rose. And roses are like, well, they're beautiful. Right. Simply put, they're beautiful. The man sees the beauty. The man appreciates the beauty. But the man desires the beauty in his own home. God put it in the ground for everybody. But you want it in your own home. So the man plucks the thing disconnecting it from the very thing that keeps it alive, brings it to his house, and though the rose beautifies his house for a moment, it withers and it dies. That is the principle of selfishness. That is the reason why all of creation is going to burn up because of what we've done, because of what we've done. There is not a cow on earth that has sinned, but there's famine and they're dying. There is not a piece, a blade of grass that has sinned, but they are dying. And the reason is because selfishness is with the man. Talking about men and women. 
So it cuts the soul off from life. It is the spirit or mind of Satan to get, to draw to self. It is the spirit or the mind of Christ to give and to sacrifice self for the good of others. Now from these, we get our, our foundational, help a brother, foundational principles. There are six, I believe, or five. The first of which is this. Christ the Son was one with the Father from the days of eternity, demonstrating his character of love. So long as there was the Father, there was the Son expressing his image. You know, some people think that Jesus is some new guy, that he just showed up, that he just showed up. Jesus Christ exists as long as the Father was there. He was the expression of who God was. Thus, when Christ came to our world, he was not some new being. He was the I am, the eternal God incarnate. This is significant because unless both the eternal divinity and the relationship between the father and his son is established, the divine purpose of the family is destroyed. Many don't even realize that the divinity of God and the Godhead have everything to do with why we are associated in what is known as families. Everything to do with it. You can't separate the two. In fact, the divinity of Jesus Christ... <clears throat> is the foundation of the entire gospel. The Bible says that the gospel is the power of God to save the believer. But then it says that we are saved in none other than Jesus Christ. And so Christ, being fully able to save man, must be God. For it is only the power of God that can save the man. To deny this is to deny both the potency and the authenticity of the gospel's power. Our second principle. Sin originated in what? Self-seeking. And such a life is death. Thus, self is the ground principle of sin. This principle is what? Self-destructive. What does self-destructive mean? If it's self-destructive, does it need help to destroy itself? No. Have you ever seen, well, I, I pray you've never held one, but have you ever seen a grenade used on YouTube, I pray? A grenade has a self-destructive principle. You pull the pin, and once that thing interacts or hits the ground or, or you, you breathe too hard, the thing explodes, taking the grenade out, and the thing that chooses to hold on to the grenade, sin is a grenade. It is a self-destructive principle in nature and therefore requires no external help to destroy it or those who live by it. We would be fools to believe that sin is a self-destructive principle and then, need, and then think that God needs to assist sin, that God works with sin, that he helps sin to destroy. Sin does the thing and sin is the principle that causes the thing. Cause and effect. Our third principle. Our world was created to be the deciding factor in the great controversy. Do you believe that? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A practical demonstration of the self-renouncing principle that is love, by which the universe is governed. This is the law of life, and thus to depart from it is to perish. Satan deceived both men and angels how? by misrepresenting the character of God. Sister White said, to know God is to love him. And thus, to draw us into rebellion with him, Satan needed only to corrupt our understanding or our knowledge of God. It's that simple. Christ does the reverse. Christ secures both men and angels by the demonstration of God's true character of love. To know God is to love him, and thus to draw us back to him. Christ needed only to give man a right understanding of God's character by demonstration. We're going to take a look at this in a moment now. Remember I told you in an open book test you need to know where to look. This is where we look. <clears throat> I'm going to read something for you. It is a terrible thing to look to the future with uncertainty, to search for hope in things to come and see only darkness and confusion. It is always better to view the entire issue from the vantage point of hindsight. That is, to be able to look back and calculate and realize where you came from. Sister White says that we have nothing to fear, lest we forget where the Lord had led us in the past. Amen? And so it is a privilege to look at things from hindsight. We've been given a more sure word of prophecy. It shows us the future, and it teaches us through history that the future is to happen again. The past repeats itself. The only way that looking back isn't beneficial as if you're Lot's wife. That's the only way. Mm. Other than that, it's going to help you. And so, when decisions are to be made and sides are to be taken, such as in this great controversy, it is far better to know the end 
of the controversy prior to its finale than it is to be ignorant of the end. Why? Because a man who knows the outcome of a controversy can be assured that he is choosing the right side. While a man who is ignorant of the end makes his choice in uncertainty. The Bible says that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A man that is unstable cannot be trusted to make the right decision. And if you cannot be trusted to make the right decision, then you cannot say you're calling an election is sure. You cannot. And so we need to learn where we ought to look. Keep in mind that the events of Calvary serve as the ultimate vantage point for the believer. It serves as a hindsight perspective in that prior to the revelation of the character of God given on the cross, mankind couldn't understand his character. Turn with me in the Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Not even angels, brother. Not even angels. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14 and 16. We're going to see that the Apostle Paul told us this, and then we're going to see how Sister White uh, brings it up. 2 Corinthians 3, 14 through 16. When you're with me, say amen. 3, 3 verses 14 through 16. The Bible says, speaking of the Jews, but their minds were what? Blinded. blinded. Is Laodicea blind? Yes. So we have the same issue. Let's find out what it is. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of what? The Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Israel had an issue with understanding the character of God because Israel was so used to allowing the acts of the Old Testament to interpret who Jesus should be rather than seeing who Jesus was and allowing his life to unfold the principles and mechanisms of all his acts in the Old. But the apostle goes on to say in verse 15, but even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, it shall turn, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. So in seeing Christ manifested on Calvary, revealing the character of God, everything that made us fear him in the negative sense, everything that made us reject him, rebel against him, to continue in sin is taken away completely. Calvary is a complete remedy. Sister White says in Great Controversy, page 652, paragraph 1, the mystery of the cross explains all other mysteries. In the light that streams from Calvary, the characteristics of God, which have filled us with fear and awe, appear beautiful and attractive. Mercy, tenderness, and parental love are seen to blend with holiness, justice, and power. In Gospel Workers, she says in page 315, that the sacrifice of Christ as an atonement for sin is the great truth around which all other truths cluster. Mm -hmm. Calvary is the center. Would you say it's in its right place here? Amen. Calvary is the center. All other truths cluster around Calvary. In order to be rightly understood and appreciated, every truth, how many truths? Every. every truth in the word of God from Genesis to Revelation must be studied in the light that streams from the cross of Calvary. So the prophet, Sister White, and the Apostle Paul agree that our vantage point is Calvary. The entire great controversy is over who God is, what he is really like, and how he operates. Thus, Calvary is the perfect vantage point from which to view the entire controversy. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So my question is this. Here's where the son was given. What was the motivation, according to John 3.16, that the father gave the son? Love. Love. Okay, so it can be concluded that God is? Love. You have the answer to the controversy right there. Mm -hmm. And the best thing about having the answer to the controversy right there is that, I'll wait. This timeline here represents all of eternity. You have eternity past, eternity future. And you have the present sin crisis in which the character of God was revealed. Sister White says that it is in a crisis that character is revealed. And so the character of God couldn't have been revealed at a better time than this crisis. Mm -hmm. Eternity, represented by this line here, is not the entire great controversy. The reason I say that is because the controversy had a beginning and it has a finish. So it comes within eternity, but it is not eternity itself. Praise God. 
Now, the question to be answered throughout all of this is who is God? We said that the answer found at Calvary is God is love. Why is that significant? You see, God is eternally consistent. The Bible says in Malachi 3, verse 6, that I am God, I change not. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8 says he is Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. So that shows us that if you can find God just one time and realize who he is just one time, you will know who he was and who he will be. It all makes sense. So the fact that God is love settles that when Lucifer started his foolishness, God was love. And in the future, we can trust that God will continue to be love. Right. Amen. And like I said, the beauty of knowing that from the beginning, That's right. Amen. love never fails. That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8 tells us. So we enter the controversy with a vantage point. We know who's going to win. How easy can your decision be? Mm. Choose this day whom you will serve. It's either life or death, and we know who holds the power of life. Mm. 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 Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. From Calvary... Our vantage point, we are given the answer in all three segments of time, past, present, present, and future. In seeing that God is love, during the sin crisis, we may conclude that he was love prior to it and that he will continue to be love long after it because God changes not. I want to look at a couple of quotations in regards to Christ's eternal coexistence with the Father. But we're going we're gonna to study the fact that God was love. If you study that God will continue to be love, you'll find many wonderful principles, like the principle of why it is that sin will not rise up a second time. It's not arbitrary, you know. It's not that God puts his, his hand around your throat and tells you you're not going to sin again or I'll get you. That's not what it is. When you understand that God is love, that principle makes sense. The fact that God is love is full with principles already because it helps us in the sin crisis. But the fact that God was love, let's see what it does. For the family, let's see what it does. In all eternity past, God was love. This is established by the fact that he does not change and is eternally consistent. Why is this point significant? Love is the principle of the mutual giving of oneself between how many? Two or more individuals for the benefit of the next person. Thus, if God is love, is God love? Yes, he is. Yes, he is and has no beginning, then he has always had another whom he has given himself to. If that's not so, then God can't be love. Love requires two or more individuals because I can't give myself to myself. That's selfishness. The father couldn't give himself to the father. The father had to give himself to the son, and the son had to give himself to us. If it were not so, then the light, in light of the very principle, God could not be love. This principle testifies to the eternal relationship between the father and his son. The Bible says that there are three that bear witness in heaven. And these three, known as the Godhead, have always been love in action. It has been so throughout all of eternity past, and so it is now. To remove the fact that all three persons of the Godhead eternally coexisted together is to undo the fact that God is love. Love's very nature demands that there be two persons at the very least in order for this living principle to function. Does it make sense? All right. I want to look at some quotations from Sister White establishing the fact that Christ indeed was eternally with the Father. Thus we can conclude that God is love. Christ is the pre-existent, what's that word? Self, -ex what does it mean to be self-existent? You don't need anything to help you have to live. I don't owe my existence to anybody else. I've, I've been there. The Father was from eternal ages, and we think that Christ just poofed out of nowhere. Sister White tells us that he was self-existent, the Son of God. In speaking of his pre-existence, Christ carries the mind back through dateless ages. That means you won't find a date. It says he assures us that there never was a time when he was not in close fellowship with the eternal God. So long as the father existed, the son existed. He to whose voice the Jews were then listening, speaking of Christ, had been with God as one brought up. What's that word? With, with, him. with him. So Christ was brought up with God. I've heard the argument before that the fact that Christ was brought up with God must mean that the father was raising him in some way. It does not say that he was raised by his father. It says he was brought up with 
his father. Yeah. The difference between me raising my brother up and me being raised up with my brother is my brother and I have been together for the same amount of time. We came up together. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. So Christ was brought up with, with his father. He was equal with God, infinite, meaning eternal, and omnipotent. He is the eternal, self-existent son of God. But while God's word speaks of the humanity of Christ, praise God, when upon this earth, it also speaks decidedly regarding his, pre, pre, his preexistence. The word existed as a divine being, even as the eternal son of God, in union and oneness with the father forever and ever. Christ was God, essentially, and in the highest sense, he was, God, he was with God from how long? All eternity. If Christ was with God from all eternity, how much of eternity does, does that does that? encompass just a, little bit. just a little bit that's what you say it's all of it it encompasses all of eternity that means that throughout all eternity there's not a point that you can find where christ was not with the father it is all eternity not some and then when you choose to bring christ in that's not what happened in christ is life original unborrowed underived and i'm thankful that in christ we receive that very life now let's talk about the duo reality of love there are two realities to love We've already established that God is love, amen? Based upon this fact, we must also conclude that whatever God is, love must be also. However he is described, love must also be described. Now let us focus on this text. Colossians chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. Colossians chapter 1, verse 14 and 15 tells us something about God, therefore telling us something about love that we need to see. Say amen when you're there. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Speaking of Christ, the Bible says, Who is the image of the invisible God? Is that what the Bible says? Yes. That Christ is the image of the invisible God? So therefore we can conclude, according to the Bible, that God is invisible. Okay? God is invisible, but God is also love. Therefore, love is invisible. How many people in here love somebody? Family, friend, foe? I hope you all raise your hand. You don't have to raise your hand. I'll just assume. Everybody in here loves somebody. But in you telling the person you love them, do they see that? Can I see that you love me by you telling me you love me? No. Love is invisible. You say that, but it needs to be, there needs to be something that makes love visible. Because until it is visible, it is invisible. Love is infinitely visible. Selfless, meaning self is infinitely hidden, unseen, and thus invisible. That is why love is invisible. Because love doesn't demonstrate self. If you're hidden, I can't see you. Why, 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 do, why do we see each other? In principle, I'm glad to see you. Love is invisible. Yet what is love? It is the principle of total self-sacrifice, the infinite denial of oneself for the joy, peace, freedom, and security of somebody else. Love entirely disregards itself, yields every right, and gives up everything to both secure and ensure these blessings for the next person. The greatest exhibition of this fact is seen at Calvary. And we know the text uh, to show us that. In this was love that God gave his son. Thoughts for an amount of blessing. She says that when love fills the heart, it will what? It will flow. Love flows out to others, not because of favors received from them, but because love is the principle of action. Here's an example. It is not love for a son to wash the dishes because his mother bought the food. That's, that's not love. You wash the dishes because you ate. Love is to sweep the floor when your mother can't do it. Love is for me to do what is known as service. Service and duty, there's a difference. It is my duty, <clears throat> it is my duty as a son to take care of my mother, amen? It is my service to take care of my mother at the expense of myself infinitely. Greater love hath no man than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. That's the principle that Jesus taught. Love is an action principle that once in the heart must be demonstrated. You can't hide it. That's the dual mystery of love. 
It is the very nature of love to flow from one individual to another, thus the dual reality and the mystery of love. Love, because of its eternal selflessness in nature, is infinitely invisible, and yet because of its demonstrative nature, it cannot be hidden. So love is invisible, but you can't hide it. That's what love is. Hmm. Question, what do you see in this picture? She looking by faith. My sister says she sees the wind. Can you, can you physically see the wind here? No, then tell me why my sister says she could see the wind. I agree with her, but why did she say it? She saw, amen, she saw the effect. She saw the effect. For every invisible reality, there is a visible expression. You see this tree over here? That, that tree's not blowing. That tree, that tree must not believe in the wind. But this tree, but this tree believes in the invisible reality. And because this tree blows, those that see this tree can also believe. Amen? Now, I might not believe this tree if you told me the wind exists. The wind we never see, but the limbs of the tree sway in response to its existence. The force that keeps the ocean and rivers in motion, the flow, we never see, but the continual flow serves as evidence that such a force ex exists. You can deny the flow of the ocean all you want until you get in the water. We have never seen our minds, but every day our words and our actions testify to its existence. By their fruit, you shall know them. All living things, whether visible or invisible, bear fruit, and thus the principle is that for every invisible reality, there is a visible expression. The reason I bring this up, Romans chapter 1, verse 20, the Bible gives us something that we need in order to understand why the family exists. Romans chapter 1, verse 20 says, For the invisible things, including the air, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood, Hold on. Being understood. So God is not comfortable with you just seeing the wind. He wants you to understand. So he creates something visible for you to see what is invisible and to understand the nature of the principle of the thing. This is what he did with the family. It says, being understood by the things that are made, even, praise God, his eternal power, which is the gospel, Amen. and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You can't tell me the wind don't exist and get away with it. You saw the picture. It's the same way you can't tell me that God does not exist when the power of God is so potent that it can change the life of man and entirely turn him around. You can't, you can't hide the fact. We say we love, right? Let me ask you a question. Are we willing to be invisible? The nature of love is to hide itself so that the Father can be seen. Think about Christ for a moment. Christ came to reveal the character of his father, not the character of Christ. Christ and the father's character are not separate. They, 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 they are one. But understand the principle. Christ came to reveal the father, not himself. Mm -hmm. Everything you love about Jesus Christ is the father. That's right. That's true. You can't tell me Jesus' favorite color. You can't tell me what his favorite food was. You can't tell me anything about Christ. Christ was hidden to the point he was invisible. Can you imagine? In Gethsemane. Everything rising up from my nature, everything rising up in my Savior, telling him I want to be seen. When we told him to get down off the cross, he knew he had the power. Can you imagine? He could have been like Caiaphas. He could have just ripped. Well, he didn't have a shirt on, I don't believe. He could have just, he could have just expounded and showed us his love, and we would, have all, we would have all been in awe, certainly. But the principle is that love hides itself, and for that very reason, he couldn't do that. Love is invisible. The reason why we refuse to hide ourselves, again, is because we think we're something to look at. We're conceited. Mm -hmm. We think we're beautiful and holy. We're dust. Mm -hmm. That's the fact of the matter. <laughs> That's the fact of the matter. Ain't nobody in here trying to marry dust. Christ beautifies dust. Mm -hmm. And when you are hidden, hear this. Hear this. Once we are invisible in God, this is the goodness of God. Once we are finally invisible, hid in Christ, God will place us on display before the entire universe, his invisible trophies that can't be hidden. Mm -hmm. Huma the 144,000. Human humanity in Christ, the divine human family, is the newborn babe that the entire universe anxiously awaits to see. Remember I told you, the great controversy is a family matter. The entire thing is family. 
The Father and the Son existed together from eternity past. And so people get confused when we hear Father and Son. We think one came before the other. A most familiar language was used to express a most unfamiliar principle, one that we gave up in Eden. God used our language in the family context for us to see how a family operates. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Think about it. Lucifer is a terrible child, a brat, that has been throwing a temper tantrum for over 6,000 years. And look at the patience of God. 6,000 years. And some of us, some of us, well, we know that when somebody gets on that last nerve, we're ready. 6,000 years? Not even six seconds. Let's contrast Christ and Satan for a moment. Because I heard uh, Brother Mikey speaking earlier about selfishness versus selfless love. If the picture doesn't say it, I don't know what will. <laughs> but sin originated in self-seeking. Lucifer, the covering cherub, desired to be first in heaven. He sought to gain control of heavenly beings to draw them away from their creator and win their homage to himself. Therefore, he misrepresented God, attributing to him the desire for self-exaltation. So we know that Christ had to come and reveal the opposite. Here is a created being who thinks he's a king. Here is God who would prefer to be a servant than behave like that. This is, this is disgusting. This, but this is, how, this is how our human nature displays itself. We need a new nature, and it's available. We need a new nature to change that principle in us and make it the very opposite. The Bible says about Christ, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be made equal with God. What does that mean? That means that if you came to Christ today, many people would say, well, you know, you were the prophet, but you weren't God. And they think that Christ would agree. Christ wouldn't agree. Christ knew he was equal with God. But that wasn't the issue with Christ. Christ, Christ didn't count it something to be desired. That, that's this guy. Christ didn't count it something to be desired. What Christ did was he made himself of no reputation. Christ went to high school and said, I don't want to be popular. He walked into the synagogue and he said, I don't want your positions. He stood in the presence of his father and said, I will give up this throne to make sure that they come here with me. That is the selfless nature of God. Lucifer was the opposite. Now, it is in a crisis that character is revealed. And it wasn't until Satan's accusations about the character of God that an explanation was required. How do we know this? Do you give an answer before I ask you a question? Why? Because there's an order to things. An answer comes as a result to a question. If you didn't ask, why should I say? <laughs> Answers come as a response to questions. And prior to these accusations, there were zero questionings as to the goodness of God. Sin was never a factor before. And thus, questions in regard to God's relation to the sinner, whether he destroyed them and whether he were, we were uh, truly free to choose, were never asked before. Humanity's role in Christ is to be a living revelation of the principles hidden in God from eternity past. And the principles that were hidden in God from eternity past, we saw, was that God was love. Mm -hmm. Heaven's ordained method of explanation. I want to talk a little bit about that, that reason for why we came into existence. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 9 to 11 says, And to make all men do what? See. See. We spoke about invisible things before, and we saw from Romans chapter 1, verse 20, that God is not comfortable with us just seeing. He wants us to understand. Amen? So he said, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid where? In God. Who created all things by Jesus to the intent. God had a, amen. God had a purpose in creating us. And the purpose was that all men... And fallen, well, unfallen angels, everybody, would see that the fellowship of the mystery of God, which was hid in his son, was to be demonstrated in us. That now, unto the principalities and the powers in heavenly places, might be known. Now, if it's to be made known, was it known before? It's not that it was hidden, it just wasn't understood. To be made known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose. I once heard somebody say that God made humanity because he was lonely. That's foolishness. God had an eternal purpose long before creation to wrap everything up in his son. And we were going to be the, 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 
the connected, how do I want to say this, Lord? We were to be connected with Christ in such a way that to see God was to see us. To see us was to see God. God saw dust and God saw, hmm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make you look just like me. We look in the mirror, we see a pimple and we run away. God looked in the mirror, saw all of us zits and said, I'm going to make you look better. And I'm going to take all of that away on top of that. Now, what say the scriptures? Turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 28, talking about the family. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 28. If you're with me, say amen. amen. The Bible says, and God said, let us make man in what? Our Is our singular or plural? Again, we see that God was not talking to himself. He's not crazy. He was speaking to the son. It says, we will make them in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he them, male and female created he them. That shows us that in order for God to demonstrate what love was, he decided he would make a man and a woman. Why? Remember the principle. Love, in order to function, requires how many? Two or more. So we, we, can't, we can't think that Adam alone was the image of God. No, because Adam alone could not demonstrate the, the principle of selfless, selflessness to anything except the animals. And God needed somebody that was equal with Adam for him to demonstrate the principle of love that was found between the father and his son throughout eternity past. It says, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful. Here's where children come in. And multiply and replenish the earth. What's interesting is that when you hear about the father and the son, you never hear about the Holy Spirit having a throne. You hear about the father's throne and the son sits in the throne and the Holy Spirit appears to be invisible. He's just nowhere, right? When you look at Adam and Eve, God created one and he created two. He said be fruitful, but the children at one point weren't there. Yet, the gospel teaches us that everybody in this room was in Adam. That's right. We were all there, we were invisible, all. but we were all there in Adam, in the seed. Remember, love does what? It flows. Right. Mm -hmm. Check this out. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created. That means, in the beginning, love created. Love operates by creation. Mm -hmm. In the human family, God gave us what is known as procreation. It doesn't make any sense why a, a procreating uh, race would be anti-creation, evolutionist. It doesn't make sense. We are procreation, therefore we must be procreation. God placed in us the seed, which was the children. Invisible, but they would be fruitful and multiply. God put it in the man. The man and the woman come together and do what is known as making love. Mm -hmm. Love creates, amen? Right. They come together, the, 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 the father or the man flows the children into the bosom of the woman. The woman, the, the children come to fruition in the woman. And in the children coming into the world, joy is reciprocated back to the, to the parents. That is the function of the family. Mm -hmm. The family was designed to operate that way because that is how the Godhead operates. Amen. Now, the family of man was created to be a demonstration of the principles by which the Godhead family operates. We agree? Mm -hmm. We were a new creation. The answer to questions which had never been asked before. Prior to Satan's lies about God's operations, there was no need for any explanation on this point. Once those questions were asked, God was ready. Amen. The answer was to be given by revelation of Christ through the human family. Does humanity today recognize the divine purpose in the family? Absolutely, Absolutely not. And I'll tell you why we don't understand it. If the principle of love is to be selfless, we wouldn't have divorce. It would be impossible. The reason why we divorce is not because God is okay with it. No. We know from principle that God has what is known as the permissive will, and he has his perfect will. The permissive will, we don't want. We want God's perfect will. God meets us where we are. But because we are so selfish, and it takes you offending me for me to want to be apart from you, that's what divorce is. God had to permit the thing to happen in order to lead us into the truth that when we are united in Christ, there is no separating us. There's no separating us. 
could not be divorced if we understood the purpose of the family. As a matter of fact, there would be no such thing as family court if we understood the family. Why would you take your, your son, your daughter, your, your husband, your wife into family court and sue them when you were designed to stop Satan's accusations in a great controversy about a family in heaven? So you're trusting to an earthly power to explain to you how the family functions, all the while you have the knowledge of the great controversy? It makes no sense. Satan has robbed us. He's, there's a reason why homosexuality has been legalized in the United States of America, and there's a reason why the National Sunday Law is so close. Satan understands that the home is the heart of the nation. If you change the home, you change the nation. Thus, in changing the principles that God established for the family, Satan has already caused the dragon to come forth in America. He's already done it. We're just waiting for a greater manifestation, but he's already done it. And so what needs to happen now is that the families who understand the great controversy, amen, everybody in here, needs to make sure that the principles of popery don't exist in the home. If the principles of popery exist in our homes, don't be surprised when the mark of the beast comes and you're, you're, you're yielding. You will do what you have practiced to do. In Christ, heaven served as the... Hmm. This, is, this, is a, this is a truth that I love. In Christ, heaven served as the adoption agency for the orphans of Adam. And Adam, in giving us up, did not demonstrate love at all. I remember there was a brother who had, who had told us that in choosing to disobey God in, in Eden, Adam was demonstrating that he loved Eve more than he loved God. Adam was demonstrating that he loved himself. Adam did not love Eve. And the reason why we know it, not that he didn't love Eve ever, he didn't love Eve when he made that decision. And the reason why we know it is because according to Romans 13 verse 10, love keeps the law. Right. Love is the fulfillment of the law. So you can't break the law and claim love. Right. Unless it's love of self, which isn't love at all. Exactly. Adam so loved himself and his desire of his wife for himself that he gave all of us up. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. There is no life in the love of self demonstrated by Adam. But there is eternal life in the selfless love of the father demonstrated in the giving of his son. The home is to be the sanctuary to the active principle of self-renouncing love. Amen. And every Adventist family is to understand this. Genesis 1. I spoke about this a little bit already. In the beginning, God created. That is to say that in the beginning, love created. Creation is the principle of love in action. God designed that through the human family, this principle of power, the gospel, would be demonstrated. Love works by creation. How often? Always. Always. Love does not destroy. Has the uniting of man and woman in marriage relation ever resulted in the blowing up of some city or the drowning of hundreds of people? No. This never happens when a man and a woman come together. And they were the ones designed to demonstrate the principle of love. When a man and a woman come together demonstrating the principle of creation, which is love in action, the result is always life. You can't tell me that God destroys, God is love, and then look at the marriage relation and still hold to, to, hold to that belief. It doesn't make any sense. Marriage crushes that belief. It crushes it. This was the principle to be demonstrated in the human family. Now let's talk about the home and the National Sunday Law Crisis. We're coming to a close. Sister White says in the Adventist Home, page 15, paragraph 1, society is composed of what? Family. Amen. And this and is what the heads of families make it. Out of the heart are the issues of life. And the heart of the community, of the church, and of the nation is the household. We wonder why homosexuality is passed in the nation. We wonder why there's apostasy in the church, but we refuse to acknowledge the responsibility of the home in all of it. We refuse. We're innocent, right? If the home was innocent, the church could be saved from the apostasy. If the home was innocent, the nation would not be legalizing the things it's legalizing right now. The well-being of society, she says, the success of the church, the prosperity of the nation depend upon home influences. I remember a quotation where Sister White said, that national apostasy is followed by national ruin. national ruin. But national prosperity depends on the home. So that means that long before the national Sunday law, which is national apostasy, happened, the destruction of the home was to take place. Is it happening? Revelation 13 verse 11 
tells us that there is a nature change in our government that is taking place even now. The Bible says in Revelation 13, verse 11, And I beheld another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. The Bible says that this lamb-like nation is going to speak through Congress as a dragon. And we now know that the reason it's going to happen is because Satan has taken the lamb, the gospel, out of the home and brought every principle of Babylon into the home. I don't care if it's dress or music or diet. He has done it. We have done it. And this is the reason why national apostasy is about to happen. We have to accept that selflessly. Amen. How is the home to be built? Everything that the Christian has to do with is done by the faith of Jesus Christ. Amen. Everything. The Bible says in Psalms 127 and verse 1 about our homes, except the Lord build the house, they labor how? In vain. In vain that build it. Lord, why can't I help this person? Why can't I help that person? Why won't they come back to church? The only way that we are going to rectify all of that is when the Lord is allowed his place as the head above the head. It's the only way. The family functions under Christ. There's an order. You agree there's a structure. That's right. And Christ is the, is the head of the structure. When we remove Christ and put man in his place, we are admitting that the mystery of iniquity is better than the mystery of godliness. Because wow. wow. that is the nature of the mystery of iniquity. It is to take God out of his place and put a pope in his place. Mm. To put a king in his place. Mm. To put a conference in his place. Wow. 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 That is the mystery of iniquity. Wow. Sure. She says in Adventist home, page 179, that the cause... Of division. I heard that if we know the cause, if we ascertain the cause, then there's a remedy to follow. The cause of division and discord in families and in the church is separation from Christ. But Jesus told Laodicea that. He told us he was on the outside not going to get back into our hearts. He told us this. To come near to Christ is to come near to one another. See, see how beautiful the principle is right there? He told us the cause and then he gave us the remedy. The secret of the unity in the church and in the family is not diplomacy, it's not management, it's not a superhuman effort to overcome difficulties, though there will be much of this to do, but it is union with Christ. Thus the message of righteousness by faith. We are one with Christ. And so I say, as you've heard this morning, all is in Christ. The, the reunion of the family is in Christ. Unity with Christ is unity with one another. One well-ordered, well-disciplined family tells more in behalf of Christianity than all the sermons that can be preached. The greatest evidence, what kind of evidence? The greatest evidence of the power. What is the power? That's the gospel. The greatest evidence of the gospel that can be presented to the world is a well-ordered, well-disciplined family. This will recommend the truth as nothing else can. We can formulate plots to knock on doors and hand out books as much as we want, and it's all ha it all has its place in the work. But if the family is not functioning according to divine principle, it is all for nothing. Mm. Nothing else can do what the family can do, for it is a living witness of its practical power upon the heart. Mm. 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 I want to end by showing you this video. Uh, if you mind uh, pressing play for me. Remember, I said that the human family in Christ is the newborn babe that the entire universe is anxiously waiting to meet. Everybody in heaven. There isn't, there isn't a name in here that isn't known in heaven. We're the lesson book of the universe. We strive in this world to be famous while we're famous in another world because of somebody else. Christ has already done all of this. If you would uh, press play. Is there volume? Again, I say our God is stronger. Is it connected? All right. You got to rewind it, brother, because they don't know why she's crying. Nope, nope. I got it. 
Here it is. Now you press play. Don't click the video. Click the play button. There's something about new life coming into existence that causes joy, that removes pain, brings healing, and all at the same time vindicates the character of God. And that is the gospel. I want to end by letting us know that all of heaven awaits the manifestation of the divine human family in Jesus Christ. When we finally get to heaven, their reactions cannot compare to the reaction of our personal guardian angels who had to deal with us through all that we've gone through here. Their reaction cannot, cannot perfectly demonstrate how Christ feels. Christ died on the cross and had the end of this thing in view. Christ already saw the newborn babe come into the kingdom. He saw how Gabriel would react. He saw how the father would react. He knows how we will be happy. And that is all that heaven wants. The Bible the Bible says in principle, the spirit of prophecy says in Christ's object lessons, that God waits with earnest desire for the manifestation of his character in us. And once that is in the home, this whole thing is wrapped up. I want to go home. Amen. Amen. So let's address our Father. Amen. Amen. Our Father and our God who art in heaven, Lord, we recognize that we have, been, we have been less than what we should be, dear Lord. And we also recognize, dear God, that Christ has been more than we have known he could be. Father, we're asking you to remove self from us completely. Father, our families are going through so much. Satan is attacking the home. And the home is your specifically ordained method of explanation, dear God. It's the reason why you created us, to demonstrate the principle of love in action. I'm praying, Father, that your spirit will dispel any animosity in the home. Father, remove the selfishness of our hearts that have caused divorce and separation and pain and hurt. Father, we need you. We have been far apart from you for too long, and we do not appreciate your presence enough. So I'm asking you, Father, please, Forgive us for having you wait for so long. And help us, dear God, to be the very reason in Christ why you're able to return at long last. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.